Okay. Hello. Um, so just before I start, are there any questions about the handing in the final paper or anything like that? All right, so um, I'm not really gonna do like a grand uh, conclusion lecture for the course, but I, but I am gonna talk um, something that might be a little bit in that direction. I'm gonna talk uh, more about Wilson Kraft's relationship to Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau today. I mean, I know I've obviously already talked about that quite a bit, but, um, and, um, and that will also like take us back to some of the fundamental issues that keep coming up throughout the course, right? Like the relationship between law and freedom and rationality and punishment. Um, so, uh, so you might think this particular chapter, chapter 13 was not like very promising material for that. I mean, it's kind of, uh, a bunch of miscellaneous topics. Um, some of them are not obviously that interesting, like a rant about how like women waste too much time reading novels. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, there's actually a lot of fundamental points mixed in there. Um, and to start off the comparison to Locke, um, let me read what she says at the very end of the book. Um, well, almost the end of the book, second to last paragraph on page 201. Let woman share the rights and she will emulate the virtues of man for she must grow more perfect when emancipated. Um, or justify the authority that chains such a weak being to her duty. If the latter, now, I mean, obviously, uh, at least I take it, it's obvious, Wilson Kraft isn't seriously considering this alternative, right? I mean, uh, it's kind of a, um, it's a reminder of, She's reminding you what you would you would really have to say if you believed in this alternative, right? So if the latter, that is, um, if the authority that chains such a weak being to her duty is justified, and that would she says that would be justified if women were freed and they didn't improve, <laughs> then it would be justified, right? So she says. Like if that authority were justified. So if the latter, it will be expedient to open a fresh trade with Russia for whips. This is um, another kind of weird pre-echo of Nietzsche. <laughs> um, as I think I meant, I probably mentioned this before in this course that I once, uh, did I mention this about how I asked my friend who's kind of like a Nietzsche nerd, uh, I mean, maybe I shouldn't use that. I mean, he's like a really serious Nietzsche scholar. So anyway, but I mean, but of the kind who like, like, um, you know, like gets the books that Nietzsche owned and reads the scribbles that he made in the margin and stuff like that, right? So like I asked him whether Nietzsche ever mentions Wollstonecraft and he said like uh, he couldn't find anything either in the published works or in his unpublished notes or anything. So there you go. You should have read one. <laughs> but um, so anyway, if the latter, it will be expedient to open a fresh trade with Russia for whips. Um, and then the skip, skipping some of the stuff. Allowing this position, women have not any inherent rights to claim. And by the same rule, their duties vanish. For rights and duties are inseparable. Right. And then, like, what she goes on to say in the next last paragraph is that, like, if you really believe this, men, 
then you should uh, um, not expect virtue from women any more than you expect it from your uh, like horse. Um, although we know from another thing she says early in the chapter that she doesn't really think people are educating horses correctly either. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll come back to that. But, um, but anyway, right? So she's saying like, it's completely inconsistent to say that women should be virtuous and at the same time that they should, uh, that they need uh, an external authority in place of their own reason. Um, and that of course is Locke's basic position in the whole second treatise, right? That, and I, I mentioned this last time too, that law and freedom are not opposed, rather they're the same thing so uh, your um, the the law exists in order to protect the freedom of the people who can be expected to obey it. So if you're bound by the law, the law also makes you free. And again, like uh, not in some kind of uh, tricky weird sense, like uh, the way maybe uh, thought says that. I mean, uh, okay, I don't wanna, but anyway, it's like in, in Locke, it's in a perfectly easy to understand sense. The law makes you free if you're bound by it because um, the law tells everyone else that in exchange for the way they expect you to obey it, they have to stay out of your um, your proper domain, your property, which means, again, according to Locke, like first and foremost means your your body your, your, and your your activity, um, your liberty. So, uh, like, uh, um, so Wollstonecraft is saying the same thing. If you um, um, if you don't allow someone their own property, right? And like in, in this society, most women don't have their own property, right? Like if they're married, they don't have their own property. So um, in the sense of like possessions. Now, you know, but I guess what Wollstonecraft is, is, is saying is they really, they don't have their own property at all in Locke's sense. They don't have their own body and liberty because someone else's reason is supposed to be deciding what to do for them. So, um, um, so if you don't allow someone their own property, you can't expect anything of them. Um, However, uh, the question is how this goes together with Locke's definition of punishment. Um, and the definition of punishment was part of the reading, I, you know, those, those brief readings from the essay concerning human understanding. So I, I'll read that definition of punishment again. This is uh, it's book two, chapter 28, section five. Um, moral good and evil then is only the conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law, whereby good or evil is drawn on us from the will and power of the lawmaker. Which good and evil, pleasure or pain, attending our observance or breach of the law by the decree of the lawmaker, sorry, which good and evil, pleasure or pain, attending our observance or breach of the law by the decree of the lawmaker, is, the, is what that we call reward and punishment, right? What we call reward and punishment is the good or evil, that is pleasure or pain, that attends our observance or breach of the law by the decree of the lawmaker. Um, And uh, 
Locke says that a law is vain if reward and punishment are not attached to it. Um, so in other words, like what that qualification by the decree of the lawmaker is supposed to add, and, and Locke is pretty explicit about this, I read more of the context, is that um, if, the, if the evil, that is the pain, is going to be drawn on me as a natural consequence of violating some principle that someone sets down, then that is enough to make that principle a law. So like, if I say to you, you know, don't eat food so-and-so, and you say, why shouldn't I? Then like, if I answer, because it will make you sick, um, I'm not giving you a law. Um, rather, I'm giving you advice or what Hobbes calls counsel, right? I'm telling you, like, you know, here's a principle that for your own reasons you, you want to observe. It's not a law. Whereas if I say, you know, because if you eat that food, I will smite you, <laughs> then that's a law. <laughs> right? So, because in that case, the pain that's going to come to you, or that I'm saying is going to come to you, is, is from the decree of the lawmaker, namely me. <laughs> right? So that means I'm making a law for you if I do that. I mean, of course, like, it has to be true. I have to really have the power to do it. I can't just say it. But, um, right. So, um, and, um, and so that's the way Locke understands law. So the way the law, the way you become free of the law, I'll draw this picture again that I kept drawing when we were talking about this in law, right? That the way I become free of the law is that the law keeps everyone else out of my space, literal or metaphor and metaphorical. <laughs> um, and uh, the, how does it keep everyone out of my space? Not by literally building a wall around me, right? But by what Hobbes calls an artificial chain, that is by attaching bad consequences to going into my space. So, um, um, and those bad consequences come from the will of the lawmaker. So um, recall furthermore that Locke, unlike Hobbes, thinks that the law of nature, which is the divine law or the law of reason, is literally a law in the state of nature, not just a counsel of reason, right? So Hobbes said in the state of nature, the law of nature isn't really properly called a law. Um, it's really just a counsel of reason or a theorem of reason. Right, just, I mean, if I, if I tell you don't eat this because it will make you sick, and I, like, I have a proof of that, then it's like a theorem, <laughs> right? So, uh, um, and if you follow the proof and reach the same conclusion, then uh, you're not gonna wanna eat it, and it has nothing to do with me saying it. So, um, so Hobbes says in the state of, in a civil state, the, sovereign commands that we obey the law of nature and then it becomes an actual law but in the state of nature um, it's not actually a law um, and it's true he does say in the same place that if we look at the law of nature as a divine command then we are looking at it as a law right so if we regard it as not just the theorem of reason but god's command we are looking at it as a law but, um, you know, I'm not going to go through all of this again, obviously, but um, when I talked about this before in Hobbes, I tried to show that um, if you look in carefully into what being a divine command means, according to Hobbes, in a state of nature. So why is that important, right? Because in a state of nature, there's no authorized spokesperson for God. In a civil state, the sovereign tells you who speaks for God. 
but in the state of nature, there's no authorized spokesperson for God. So what does it mean that something's a divine command in the state of nature, according to him? And um, I tried to show that it, it's really just another way of saying that you'd be well advised to do something. <laughs> um, so, um, so when he says we could call it a law, if we look at it as a divine command, I think it means something like, if we choose to describe something God could do in a state of nature as a command, then by the same kind of loose use of terminology, we can call this law a law. But strictly speaking, God doesn't give commands because God doesn't have desires. And uh, so therefore it's really not a law. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, so, uh, but Locke disagrees, right? Locke thinks that it is a law in the state of nature. Um, so, um, Locke thinks that there must be bad consequences that follow from breaking the law of nature in the state of nature because of the will of the lawmaker. That is the legislative in the state of nature, like whatever that is, right? So because of the, the will of the legislative power in the state of nature, that's why bad consequences attach to breaking the law of nature. Um, and then, uh, of course, there also has to be an executive. So, right, that is, there has to be someone who actually carries out those bad consequences when someone actually does violate the law. Um, now, you know, in, when I talked about this before, I, I said that in the essay, it sounds like the executive of the law of nature in the state of nature is God, right? So that in the essay, it sounds like in the state of nature, why should you not violate my natural rights? Because God will punish you if you do. And you're supposed to be able to um, arrive at that information by demonstration. Right, not by authority. So you're supposed to be able to prove the existence um, of God, and I guess to prove that God wants what's best on the whole for rational creatures, not like what's best for me individually. And when you put those things together, you're able to conclude that God having the power will definitely punish people who violate it. That's the argument of the essay. In the second treatise, it sounds, on the other hand, like in the state of nature, the executive is everyone, all, all the people in the state of nature. Right? This, I'll read this um, again. This is from uh, uh, chapter two, section seven. The execution of the law of nature is in that state put into every man's hands whereby everyone has a right to punish the transgressor, transgressors of that law to such a degree as may hinder its violation. It's a little bit weird that it's a right and not a duty. But um, maybe there's a good reason for that actually. Otherwise it would be circular or something. But it's a right that we expect people to uh, exercise. Otherwise, I think this wouldn't this wouldn't work, right? Uh, so, for the law of nature would, as all other laws that concern men in this world, be in vain if there were nobody that, in the state of nature, had a power to execute that law, right? So, according to the second treatise, and I, I don't know how to put these two things together, <laughs> but um, I have some ideas, but I, I don't really know exactly. But in the second treatise, it sounds like the reason in the state of nature you shouldn't violate my natural rights is that everyone around will punish you. So, um, so that's the executive, but who's the legislative in the state of nature, according to Locke? Um, so, I mean, you can think of several alternatives here. One is that the legislative is God. I mean, that, you know, makes sense. He's calling it the divine law, which is one of the things he calls it. Um, you also might think that the legislative is 
just like the executive, everyone. Um, or you might think if this is different from the above two things, that the legislative is reason. Right? I mean, that's why it's called the law of reason. <laughs> this, this might be a way to understand why it's called the law of nature. Uh, it follows from human nature, right? Um, so, uh, um, so I think the answer should be um, a, it should be that it makes no difference which of these three things you consider to be the legislative, according to this. Um, because at least uh, in a state of nature, without bringing in other assumptions, like we've had a revelation or whatever, uh, we know what the divine will is by figuring out what a wise and good being would want us to do by reasoning it out. Um, so this isn't really different from the first. Um, right? When we say God wills it, uh, we don't know that because God said, I will this. <laughs> We know it because we because we think we've proved what kind of a being God is, and from that we derive what such a being would will. Um, but it's also really there, neither of them are really different from this because this, like what a wise and good being would will for the sake of all of us, is it's what Rousseau calls the universal will, right? It really is what we all want, taken together. Right when you sort of subtract out all the all our private interests, this and and say um, you're not allowed to make particular decrees. You have to make a universal law. This is what we want. Um, only, of course, uh, it's not the universal will of some people or other in some commonwealth, right? It's the universal will of all rational beings. Um, so, uh, um, so it doesn't exactly, so that's why I'm saying it doesn't really make a difference which of these answers you give. And that's um, probably why Locke doesn't bother to talk about it. It doesn't matter. Um, you could look at it any of those three ways. However, the question is, um, there's still a question left over, which is the same as Rousseau's question about founding the Commonwealth. In what sense has the legislative appointed the executive? So um, if the legislative hasn't appointed the executive, then Locke's condition to make it a law is not fulfilled, right? Because like, if, if I say, don't eat that food, and you say, why? And I say, because if you do, see that guy over there, he's going to smite you. That's still just advice. Unless that guy is my agent. Right, unless that guy is going to smite you because I, you know, appointed that guy for that function. So, um, so if the legislative hasn't appointed the executive, then it's not going to be what Locke calls a law. Um, and you might say, well, but. Look, it's not necessary here because the legislative is the executive. Um, but I think it's still necessary because um, um, Locke agrees with Rousseau that a law has to be universal. So, like, God can't even appoint himself the executive. 
Now, I mean, obviously, as soon as I say that, you can see that there would be ways around that. I mean, although I think it's not as easy as you might imagine. Like, I don't, I mean, the trick that Rousseau uses to found the Commonwealth, where the um, people kind of like switch hats and become a democracy, and that's the real government, and, and they decide how it's going to be set up. Um, uh, that's right. I feel like that won't work here. Um, 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 because we're not entering a compact at this rate, like we're not we're not entering a covenant at this point. So we're not all putting our force at someone's disposal at our at our collective disposal. Yeah, how are we? Because if we're deciding to to create the legislature, then how? How would we, how can we do that without entering a covenant? Well, is that like on either, see, on, on any of these three answers, no one decides to create the legislature. That's the right, like, that's why this, that's why this holds in the state of nature. You don't need uh, to decide who is the legislator because it's right, like, it's, it's just saying what, uh, what we should all want to do. That's so, um, like, it's not, yeah, I mean, it's not, this legislative isn't going to like meet and make positive laws. It isn't gonna legislate. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so there's, there's no, yeah, I think there's there's no covenant going on here. Um, uh, in the Bible too, for what it's worth, the first covenant is between God and Noah. Not there's no covenant between God and Adam. That could be interpreted. <laughs> yeah. Isn't the covenant like employed in the appointing of a, of the executive, though. Well, exactly, and that's why I'm saying that that I that that there's a problem with appointing the executive here. That Rousseau's solution, um, which involves the fact that we are entering a covenant, um, uh, will solve. Um, Maybe it will help if I say if I say a little bit about why I'm talking about this, like why I'm trying to explain that, that, that why you might think that this problem can't be solved in the case of the law of nature. Because um, so chapter 13 is where Wollstonecraft makes what seems to be one of her most explicitly religious arguments in this book. And it's an argument against believing in astrology or in miraculous or magical cures for diseases. Um, and like, I think at first it might seem surprising that she appeals to religion rather than science, right? Like if, if you were to t say why um, these women are so foolish and like i'll take her grant i'll take her word for it that it's especially women in this time and place who are interested in astrology and uh and miraculous cures so you know so like um if you you might think if she wants to convince these women that they are foolish to do this she should say well you know there's no scientific basis for this um, 
but instead she appeals to religion. Now, um, um, of course, the type of religion she appeals to, she explains towards the bottom of page 189, um, I know that many devout people boast of submitting to the will of God blindly as to an arbitrary scepter or rod. In other words, like people in the common concerns of life, they do homage to power and cringe under the foot that can crush them. Rational religion, on the contrary, is a submission to the will of a being so perfectly wise that all he wills must be directed by the proper motive, must be reasonable. So, I mean, so, so far, this is like an agreement with law. Re is, remember, I said, like, the reason these two things are the same, according to Locke, in the state of nature. Um, and maybe this is another way of seeing why we don't need a covenant for this. That, um, um, that reason is the same is that there's nothing arbitrary in this law. There's nothing that depends on the divine will in the sense where you would like have to ask God, what is your will? It's, it's, uh, it's a will which is like assumed or proved to be um, a will that commands doing what you ought to do. Um, and as far as what figuring out what you ought to do, you can do that by yourself. So, um, right, so that's the type of religion she's talking about. So, but why is this type of religion inconsistent supposedly with astrology or like magnetic healing or whatever? Now, I mean, um, as an argument directed against these these practices in particular, I think it depends on uh, um, how the practitioners of them describe them. Like, because if they say, uh, no, there's nothing miraculous about this. We're just, there's some natural laws that we know about. We're experts. Then I don't think her argument is going to work. So, but her assumption is that these are supposed to be magical, right? So um, that astrology is a kind of prophecy, basically. Um, a kind of claim to, to prophecy or to being an oracle that can foretell the future. I mean, uh, like whether, I, I don't know if that's, accurate as to how astrologers, you know, like perceived themselves at this time or, or depicted themselves. Um, um, I mean, because obviously like a physician, for example, claims to be able to foretell the future better than the rest of us can. Like, you know, uh, am I gonna get better from this disease? The rest of us are like, I don't know. The physician is like, well, according to my diagnosis, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, is like, um, are they right? If they're a physician in the late 18th century, probably not. <laughs> they're probably not that much more correct than astrologers about, about a lot of things. But, you know, but as far as like the criticism she's going to aim against this astrology, I think they're free of that because they think, you know, they're trying to foretell the future by understanding how the body works and so on and so forth. But so anyway, this having said all of that, this is the argument she uses to attack astrology and so forth. This is on page 188. Um, um, from the whole tenor of the dispensations of providence, it appears evident to sober reason 
that certain vices produce certain effects? And can anyone so grossly insult the wisdom of God as to suppose that a miracle will be allowed to disturb his general laws, to restore to health the intemperate and vicious, merely to enable them to pursue the same course with impunity? Right, so the point is that you shouldn't believe that uh, like um, astrologers have special powers to foretell the future or that magnetists have special powers to cure diseases because um, um, both of those would be ways of saying that you can like avoid the natural effects of your actions by appealing to some supernatural knowledge. Um, but the natural effects of your actions are like um, precisely the punishment that God has in his wisdom set up to like discourage you from these vices and make you virtuous. So when you say, um, um, oh, but luckily I have this magic charm, Right, or I have this, I have this way of seeing what's going to happen in the future and preparing for it, or whatever. Right, then you're saying, um, oh yeah, God punishes everyone except people who have this magic charm. Right, so that's why she says it's a it's a gross insult to the wisdom of God to suppose that something like this would work, and that again is also why I said that, like. Um, well, so, okay, so maybe actually, it's interesting, like the way she thinks medicine works, at least in the case of, of chronic diseases, um, is, and this is the way a lot of people think medicine works. And I mean, maybe it is a good way for medicine to work. But anyway, the way she thinks that it always works is that the doctor tells you to uh, change your habits, eat different foods, et cetera. That will make you better. Um, so like basically, um, um, the idea that the doctor would, would give you a pill that like all you have to do is take this pill and uh it does something to the like proton pumps in your brain or something like that and the problem goes away um would maybe she would think that's almost as bad as going to an astrologer i don't know <laughs> uh anyway she doesn't she doesn't think about it that way so but um but the the so like, I'm not, therefore, I mean, I'm not so interested in whether this is a good criticism of people relying on astrologers or not. I'm more interested in what she says, the relationship between um, vice and divine punishment is. Namely, she sounds like Hobbes, not like Locke, right? The punishment for violating the law of nature is going to be natural, the natural consequence of violating it. Um, or, and it's, that is, it's not going to be, as she says, positive. So like, I think maybe yet another way of seeing like how bad this problem is that the legislative can't appoint the executive is that, you know, so, um, everyone agrees it's the universal will that this law should be obeyed. And according to Locke, they know that it won't be obeyed unless we attach rewards and punishments to it. Um, but uh, that's not enough to say what the rewards and punishments should be. Um, the rewards and punishments have to be, are, are like can't themselves be deduced from reason. Like the degree of them can be. Right, in the sense of like how much pain will have to be threatened in order to be a disincentive to do so and so. But like what exactly it's going to be is um, arbitrary. 
Like there would be many different ways of setting this up that would all work equally well. Um, so, uh, um, and that doesn't flow from the will of the legislature. So like whatever punishments the executive imposes here are um, like come from the executive's own private will, not from the universal will. Even if it's everyone, it comes from everyone as the like big individual that includes all the individuals. It doesn't come from the universal will. Um, and so uh, Wollstonecraft says, this is on the next page, on page 189, positive punishment appears so contrary to the nature of God. Sorry, positive punishment appears so contrary to the nature of God discoverable in all his works and in our own reason that I could sooner believe that the deity paid no attention to the conduct of men than that he punished without the benevolent design of reforming. So, um, as opposed to arbitrary punishment, she's saying that it's contrary to the nature of God as we discover from his works and from our own reason that um, he would arbitrarily attach pain to something. It has to be with the design of reforming. And, you know, so like, I think in, in her mind, what that means is it has to be with the design of reforming in the sense that when it happens, you'll be able to see that it was a natural consequence of what he did. Um, this is something people sometimes tell you about how to punish children. Fortunately, we don't have to punish our children very often. I'm not sure what I would do if we did, but <laughs> they're pretty good. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so, um, um, So now the question is, given that she agrees with Hobbes that the punishments for violating the law of nature are um, are just natural consequences of our actions, why doesn't she agree with Hobbes' conclusion? Right, because like what I kept pointing out is, was it was that how much everything in Locke that's different from Hobbes depends on this one point, that Locke, that Locke thinks the law of nature is binding in foro externo in the state of nature. Like that's what allows there to be property in the state of nature and then all kinds of things uh, follow from that. So, um, um, so if, Wollstonecraft is on Hobbes' side of that question. Why isn't her ideal society Hobbes' ideal society? Right, like absolute government. So, um, so I think, like, to begin to answer that, I guess I'll say that even though she agrees that the law of nature can't be executed by positive punishments, it's not for the same reason that Hobbes would say the law of nature can't be executed by positive punishments. So the, the reason that Hobbes says it can't be is because um, according to Hobbes, God can only speak through an authorized human interpreter. Um, so in the state of nature, 
There's no one to announce these positive punishments. Um, um, that is, the law can't be property, properly promulgated in the state of nature. Why does Locke not think that's a problem? We have just been saying that, that it looks like maybe it is a problem for Locke and that that's, what, that's where Wollstonecraft breaks with him. That, yeah, sure, no one has to announce what the law of reason is. In the state of nature, everyone can figure it out for themselves. And even granted to Locke that no one has to announce that it will be punished either by God or by everyone because everyone can figure that out too. But someone has to announce what the punishments will be. And there's no one who could do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so um, but that's not the basic problem according to Wollstonecraft uh, because the conclusion of that is that um, you know, that the way the divine law can be enforced is um, that uh, we make sure that God speaking is really just a human sovereign speaking. <laughs> right? So, like, God can speak to the people of Israel because Moses is really speaking, the one who's speaking to them. Moses is the legislator. So, um, um, so now it makes sense to say that uh, a certain law derives from God and that God, and that God is going to punish it in a certain way. Um, but again, like, how do you know that God is punishing it? Well, um, um, either certain people are punishing it at God's direction, that is, Moses told them to, <laughs> or something bad happens and someone who's authorized to speak for God says that was a punishment, right? So, um, uh, so that's the conclusion it leads to. And I take it that Wollstonecraft is criticizing Hobbes and Rousseau's view of political religion when she says, this is on page 186, the oracles of old were thus delivered by priests dedicated to the service of the God who was supposed to inspire them. The glare of worldly pomp which surrounded these impostors and the respect paid to them by artful politicians who knew how to avail themselves of this useful engine to bend the necks of the strong under the dominion of the cunning spread a mysterious veil of sanctity over their lies and abominations. Um, Right, so she's saying that this kind of political religion is uh, um, it's bad for the reason, if if, no, if for no other reason, for the reason Rousseau himself gives after he discusses it, that it's based on lies. Right, so, uh, you know, and uh, like Wollstonecraft doesn't um, say or imply this about Moses, uh, but Rousseau certainly does. Okay? Like implies that, that Moses went up the mountain and said, oh, God told me all this stuff. Here's these tablets, right? So, um, uh, um, and and I think she thinks it's obvious. I'll say a little bit more about why in a second that you couldn't found a good society on lies. I mean, Rousseau is also worried about this. Right? That's you know. 
he doesn't like in the end, he, he doesn't seem to have a good solution to this issue. Unless you count what he says at the very end of his discussion of religion, which is just that we should require all religions to be tolerant, to tolerate all religions that are tolerant. <laughs> um, um, and that meet certain minimum conditions. But even that, it's not really clear. Like if they meet those conditions because they know otherwise they're gonna be like banned from the state. Um, are those people really telling the truth? Right, so um, so I think, you know, so, so, so what is the problem according to Wollstonecraft? I think the problem according to her is that um, no one, not even God can be an authorized interpreter of God. Right? Again, there's no way for an interpreter to be authorized. It's not a lie. So like, as she says on page 198, um, um, that, that the being cannot be termed rational or virtuous who obeys any authority but that of reason. Right, so, so the divine command is the command of reason. Remember, that's what she says rational religion is. The divine command is the command of reason. Um, and, uh, um, you can't obey it because of any authority. Yeah. But isn't that an interpretation right there of God? Well, I mean, so like, yes, you can say as Locke says, um, and Hobbes also, I think says that, you know, one way God has revealed his will to us is through our reason, right? But, but, but that, <clears throat> that doesn't involve an authority. Right, like it doesn't involve someone telling me what the divine will is. It involves supposedly, I mean, like, again, I'm not asking whether this is really possible. <laughs> uh, and if so, how it would go. But supposedly, you're able to deduce on your own what the law is. And, you know, um, Um, so like in Locke, there's another step where you say, you know, where you say, and furthermore, I deduce that God will punish people who break this law and reward those who don't break it, who observe it. But in Wollstonecraft, there is no such other step, right? Because again, she's agreeing with Hobbes that when we say, and you realize that God will punish people who break it, you mean you realize what the natural bad consequences will be of breaking it. Um, so it's all like your whole reason for obeying it is your own reason. Yeah. Uh, but aren't you still like establishing the basis of power? Uh, the reason for giving government on this idea of God, like it's kind of a I you know, I I don't think so. I mean, so like the question is because well, as I said before, Wollstonecraft does seem to be serious about this, but exactly what function God is playing in her um in her ethics is not that clear. And, you know, and like, remember, I, when, by the time we were done with explaining what Hobbes does with this, I said, and so you can see why this kind of um, appeal to God in ethics could be made by an atheist, <laughs> right? Because, you know, because again, like there's no step that goes through the existence of God in the proof that you ought to obey this law. 
it's all going to be that you're going to be able to see by your own reason that this is the reasonable way to behave. And that if you don't, that will be bad consequences. Um, so there's, I mean, it's more like the way uh, uh, Interesting. I didn't think of it from this point of view before. It's actually more like the way Locke sounds in the second treatment. Um, but uh, where, you know, where there is no authority. But nevertheless, in the second treatise, uh, it's interesting. The bad consequences are going to follow. Well, let me, I think. I think when I when I go more into what the bad consequences are according to Wollstonecraft, maybe it'll be a little clearer because the, um, yeah, I think that might help. But in any case, so like I think this throws, but I mean, anyway, like I hope you understand why I'm saying that. So it's not like in Wollstonecraft's system, it's not clear what this what God is doing. I think. Uh, um, you know, like as opposed to even in Kant, uh, um, who agrees that the um, that a free being only follows the law of reason, he still says, "But we need God as the executor." Um, but she, in effect, is saying that we don't because, I mean, I don't know. It's a little hard to understand. I, maybe it's a little confusing when she says that, like, God has benevolently set up these bad consequences of vice to discourage you from doing it. Like, it's, it doesn't 100% make sense, <laughs> right? Like, if there were no bad consequences, it wouldn't be a vice, right? You might think. <laughs> um, so, I mean, because uh, otherwise this would get, it would end up being a positive punishment again, right? Like suppose God adjusted the laws of nature. There's something that God didn't want you to do for no particular reason. And God adjusted the laws of nature to make it not in your interest to do it. So there's natural bad consequences, but that can't be what we're talking about, right? That's no different from just like sending devils to whip you or something, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, well, I guess it's a little bit different because you can foresee exactly what will happen. I'm not sure. There might there there may be something I don't understand here about her religious her religious views. Um, but um, and like her later husband William Godwin, there's like no uh, um, there's no appeal to religion in his in his work. This, so, I mean, it's actually a striking contrast. Um, so, um, but in any case, so I think this throws more light on what I was saying last time about how for Wollstonecraft, there are no shortcuts or there's like no second best. Um, there's no way of um, forcing people into a correctly organized political society because um, a political society uh, has to be a society of persons. It has to be a society of responsible, rational beings. Um, and you know, I mean, of course, Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau all agree with that, but she's putting a much stricter condition on what rational, responsible beings can do, or what they should do. Now, I guess it's even what they can do. So, because like 
I basically like I can't enter a covenant to substitute someone else's command for my own reason. Um, I can't do that qua rational being because if I succeeded in doing that, I, I wouldn't be a rational being. <laughs> so, right, like, uh, yeah. Is it similar to how, like, some of the philosophers you read, like, said, like, you're not a reasonable person if you decide to harm yourself or, like, you could kill yourself? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it is similar to the way Hobbes says that you can't, um, uh, you can't give up the right to defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's not just like you shouldn't, it's that you can't, um, because, uh, like, um, you couldn't have such a will, right? Now, obviously, uh, um, um, again, Wollstonecraft is putting a much stricter condition on what it means to have such a will, right? Just like if you think of will as the desire of rational beings, practical reason, right? Then, um, then she's saying that, again, remember she said that the being cannot be termed rational or virtuous who obeys any authority but that of reason, right? So like there, the um, rational desire can't be for someone else's command, to, someone else's authority to substitute for your own reason. Um, so, um, so I so I literally can't enter a covenant like the kind that Hobbes says I should, or even the kind that Locke says I should. Um, so I mean, this shows why she can't accept Hobbes' Commonwealth, but. Um, I guess the question then would be, well, why doesn't she just conclude the situation is hopeless, right? Like it's gonna be war of all against all, there's no way out. That like, I mean, um, uh, I mean, no way out in the sense again, that something else might happen, but it's not gonna be something that's done by rational beings <laughs> as such. It's going to be something that's done by people insofar as they're, as she always says, like um, brutish or brutal, right? Meaning they're like brute beasts. They're not like rational beings. So, um, so I think the, um, this is where I want to stop and look into what kind of bad consequences they're going to be if we don't obey the law of nature. Um, now, um, it's natural to think of like simple examples, like if you drink too much, you'll get sick, right? That's a natural consequence. So it's a natural consequence of intemperance as a vice. If you drink too much, you'll get sick. If you eat too much, you'll get sick, et cetera. Um, and she does talk about examples like that, obviously. Um, uh, right, that's like that's part of the argument against this magnetic uh, healing right? that it shouldn't, there can't be a way to avoid the consequences of vicious behavior by a magic ray. You, uh, the only way um, must be to correct your vicious behavior. Um, um, It's kind of a it's kind of a natural feeling that I feel like we still have, or maybe have even more, even though we wouldn't talk about God's benevolence or whatever when explaining it, right? But like, if someone says, you know, uh, uh, hey, we've discovered this great pill you can take that will keep your body perfectly in shape and not have to do any exercise, I think 
you would all be like, he's wrong about this. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be right to feel that way, but I feel like, I think we all would feel that way, right? Like, no, you shouldn't be able to, <laughs> to, to get out of it that easily. <laughs> um, take that lazy way out, right? Um, and, you know, similarly, I think people, uh, um, like, part of the reason, not the whole reason, but part of the reason people are worried about ideas like geoengineering is the same thing, right? Like, if you say, hey, we've got this device that will scoop up all the carbon in the atmosphere or like will, you know, cut off the sunlight or whatever. And then you can not have climate change and you can keep driving your smelly car and whatever, just like you like to. I think, you know, uh, part of the reaction that a lot of people have against that is, you should, you know, this it's a sign. Climate change is a sign that we're living the wrong way. We have to correct it. <laughs> There shouldn't be a fix, right? So, like, that's what she's saying about magnetic healing. Uh, um, but, um, but anyway, like, so, so that is a type of example where you can understand how, like, how you could see natural consequences of punishments. Um, uh, but you know, uh, in temperance, as Hobbes already points out, may, like it may be against the law of nature, but it's not like a political law of nature, right? That's why, you know, at the end when he discusses the law of nature, he says, and there are also other things that can be called laws of nature, like the, you know, like I, the law against intemperance, I think is his example. And he says, but these don't concern political society, so I'm not gonna go into them here. So what's an example of a, um, it, but that is like drinking too much or eating too much is not a violation of justice. Um, so like imagine instead that, uh, let's say I suppose I set myself up as a tyrant. So I try to exercise arbitrary authority over someone else. What will be the bad consequences of that? So I guess I shouldn't say just, well, I guess there'll be bad consequences even of just trying, but let's suppose I succeed. What will be the bad consequences of that? So she says, um, for example, this is on page 200, from the tyranny of man, right? And at this point, man definitely means man as opposed to woman. <laughs> so from the tyranny of man, I firmly believe the greater number of female follies proceed, and the cunning which I allow makes at present a part of their character, I likewise have repeatedly endeavored to prove is produced by oppression. So the bad effect of oppressing people is that you make them worse. That is, you make them morally worse. Um, and then you have to live with the bad people you produced. That's the bad effect, right? Here's another place she says something like this, this is on page 194. Um, they who are taught blindly to obey authority will endeavor cunningly to elude it. Sorry, that they who are taught blindly to obey authority will endeavor cunningly to elude it is most natural and certain. That's the natural bad consequence. That's why she talks about cunning so much, cunning and envy, right? Those are, are vicious traits that people acquire by being oppressed. And it's like, is she emphasizing that because she's kind of like blaming the victim? No, she's emphasizing that because she's saying to the oppressor, if you do this, you'll make the people you have to deal with worse. And this is how, they'll become cunning, cunning they'll become envious. Um, did you have a question? I was just gonna say, wouldn't that make it uh, like, like facilitate like the same kind of oppression, like saying, because you make people worse, then you need more like uh, law enforcement and then- And then they get even worse, yeah. So like you're just like a reinforcing idea of oppression. 
Well, it's like many vices, it's kind of a runaway effect, right? It gets worse, but it, but but like you're driven to, you know, um, do it more to try to solve the problem. <laughs> um, so uh, and that just makes it even worse. Um, so, right, like to bring everything back to Socrates, she's saying the same thing he does at his trial. No rational person would willingly corrupt the youth of their own society. Um, uh, if you're doing that, it's a sign that um, you don't know what you're doing. You're not following the law of reason. And this is like some hint as to at least how, how this deduction is gonna go, right? <laughs> um, the, like the um, virtuous way of educating must be the way that produces people you would wanna live with. <laughs> Otherwise it's inconsistent. Um, so, and just like Socrates, she makes this vivid by comparing it with the training of horses. Possibly this is just a coincidence because horses, you know, of course, like, unless you have two daughters who are really into horses the way I do, <laughs> horse, you don't see horses that much these days. But of course, like horses used to always be everywhere, right? So like, it's a pretty uh, obvious example. Um, but on the other hand, maybe she is actually alluding to Socrates when she talks about this. So she says, this is on page 196. Um, uh, there's two things about horses on page 196. This is the one I want to read first. Many men attend to the breeding of horses and overlook the management of the stable, who would, strange want of sense and feeling, think themselves degraded by paying any attention to the nursery. Yet, how many children are absolutely murdered by the ignorance of women? Right, so it's just, I mean, it's literally the same argument that Socrates makes in the Apology. You know, if you wanted to train your horse, what, how would you do it? Take it to someone who was a good horse trainer. What about your son? How do you do that? <laughs> Um, so, um, um, and the answer is you don't want to do it yourself and you want it to be done by someone who you want to obey you, uh, blindly. That is by someone who's not rational, <laughs> right? So it's like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't give your horse to someone like that. You superintend that yourself. Um, but she also adds at the bottom of page 196, um, I have always found horses, animals I am attached to, very tractable when treated with humanity and steadiness, so that I doubt whether the violent methods taken to break them do not essentially injure them. I am, however, certain that a child should never be thus forcibly tamed after it has injudiciously been allowed to run wild. For every violation of justice and reason in the treatment of children weakens their reason. Right? So, like, as far as horses go, she says, even their horse is probably not the right way to go. <laughs> um, and it's probably a manifestation of the same error. Um, by the way, there's um, in Xenophon's memorabilia. Um, so, do you know who Xenophon was? Xenophon was an ancient Greek author who was a contemporary of Plato and Socrates and Aristophanes, who wrote like other Socratic dialogues. So it's like that. Other than Plato, that's one of the main. That's the main source of stories about Socrates. And Xenophon's Socrates is uh, quite different from Plato's Socrates in many ways. But, um, but this particular story, I think, is, is 
revealing that. Um, so um, Socrates' wife was named Xanthope, which means yellow horse. <laughs> so, um, so, um, and she uh, was like notoriously, I guess the word that uh, like sexist, 19th century historians would use for it is shrew, <laughs> right? She was notoriously difficult. Um, she talked back to Socrates, I guess, whatever. So in Xenophon's memorabilia, someone asked Socrates, you know, uh, like, um, if you're so wise, why is your wife so like intractable? And Socrates said, well, think about horses. Do you prefer a horse that's stupid and placid and always does what you say, or do you prefer a spirited horse? <laughs> um, indicating that like from Socrates' point of view, Xanthropy is the way she should be, I think, is what that story means. Um, so, um, Right. So, and similarly, like, you know, yeah, you can beat a horse into a, a literal horse into obeying you all the time. Socrates in the Apology also compares Athens to a horse. I don't know if you remember this. He says he's been sent by the gods as a kind of um, stinging fly to, to wake up this big sleepy horse. <laughs> um, right. So, um, but, you know, you can beat a literal horse into submission but that's not the way to make a good horse. So, I mean, anyway, that's as far as literal horses go. But when she turns the metaphor back to human beings, whether it's women like Xanthope or children or any human beings, she says, for sure, injustice and violence is not the right way to educate them. Because whatever it makes them do, at the same time, it teaches them that injustice and violence is the right way to educate someone. And um, um, uh, if you try something else, if you try those tyrannical methods, then you've punished yourself, right? Because the result is that now you have to live with a savage, cunning, like basically captive barbarian. <laughs> um, and they're going to find a way to tyrannize over you in turn if they possibly can. And that's what she says that some women do in her society, right? She says that it's true, women aren't always slaves of their husbands, but when they're not, it's not because reason has prevailed. It's because they've used cunning and they've been spurred by envy and, you know, and they've used cunning and whatever to like turn things around and get on top. Um, so um, it looks like I'm going to finish early. I don't think anyone will complain about that. <laughs> um, so because uh, that really got to the conclusion now. So like my, the conclusion is that um, um, the oppression of women and the way they in turn impress their children, as she keeps emphasizing, and oppress men too, if they can find a cunning way to do it, is an example of this dynamic, right? So it's an example of why if you commit political vices, that is, if you try to tyrannize over someone, you'll have to live with the bad effects. And there's nothing arbitrary about it. It's right, you, and like, you almost don't need to know the laws of nature predict this. <laughs> you just like have to know that somehow there's a way of educating beings. And then you'll know that if you educate them by being unjust and tyrannical, you're going to make them cunning and envious. Um, so, uh, but in any case, um, it's, it is an example of that. But I think, according to Wollstonecraft, it's more than an example. It's a fundamental cause of it. Right, as I was like trying to bring out last time, this is the um, this is the central problem that has to be fixed because all children are educated in this way, 
And as long as all children are educated in this way, we can't expect improvement in society. Um, so, I mean, turning that around though, I think that also, that's also why she's hopeful about this in the way that Hobbes and Rousseau are not. Um, you know, like they say, look at the way people are. They're never gonna become rational. We have to have some other way to keep them in line. And, and her response to that is uh, like, um, you've underestimated the political rationality of quote unquote man, because you like, you failed to notice that you weren't including, including woman in that term. <laughs> right? You tricked yourself basically, because <laughs> like um, the reason people will never be rational is because by prescription, you know, this is especially directed at Rousseau, right? You Rousseau have yourself said that they're always gonna have to treat women um, as slaves. So she says like, of course it looks to you like quote unquote, men can never become rational. You left out the most important part of the problem. Okay, that is all I have to say. <laughs> um, are there any questions before I... Comments, arguments, all right. <laughs> that's, that's always, that never works. I don't know why I always make that mistake. I'm like, if there are no questions, we can go. Are there any questions? <laughs> like, of course, there's no questions. All right. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for coming to my course and uh, have a good summer.